Hello, everybody. How's it going? Post lunch, are we awake, alive, happy? Are we very happy? We're gonna need more from you. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, I would love to have uh, two or three people, um, and don't shout out all at once, but two or three people um, holler why you, and, and loud, um, why you're here, what you're hoping to get out of this session of everything you could do, including you know, staring at the beautiful bay. Why, why is this where you've chosen to spend your time? So you're, so you're working with students who want to be employed by an impact employer. Great. Yeah. Over. Hi. I'm here because I run a startup that works to build a more inclusive workforce by partnering with workforce development programs, and we're bridging that gap between marginalized populations and professional opportunities. So I'm looking to learn more about inclusion in, in the social impact field. Oh, That's we're great. called Akimbo. AkimboConnect.com. Right. One more. Yes, ma'am. I'm very interested in this topic. I'm. Uh, a co-founder of Promo Hair, 24-year-old women's development organization in Latin America. And we're undergoing a rededication to the mission and focusing on how we treat each other and how we treat the employee, employees. If we can't treat each other with great respect and, um, I have to say, affection, um, how are we going to convey that to our, our customers or to the women that we work with? So I just see this as of a vital component of a, sex, a successful um, social enterprise. Well, that's great. Well, um, we are delighted to have all of you for uh, what I hope is a, and I'm sure is gonna be a really great conversation. We are going to um, begin by having each of the panelists talk about an aspect of this topic that they know very well. Um, and we have a couple of follow-up questions, but. We also are going to try and get to your questions pretty quickly because we want to uh, talk about what you want to what you want to talk about. So I um, I am delighted that you're here. My name is Ross Baird. Uh, I run an organization called Village Capital. Uh, we work with early stage for profit entrepreneurs looking to have a positive impact on society, and we've uh, done it for the last five years. We run accelerator programs for companies uh, in partnership with um, many of the people in this room and many of the people on this stage. Uh, we make investments in the graduates of those programs, and we've uh, worked with over 450 entrepreneurs around the world over the last five years. Um, I was, uh, yesterday I heard uh, Anthony Bug Levine, who wrote the Impact Investing book, say that uh, he always sees one of his dearest friends in the world, Willie Foote, who founded Root Capital, which is another very well-known organization at these conferences. And they rarely see each other, not at these conferences, but he says every time he sees Willie, he says, he and Willie ask each other a question, which is, what do you know now that you didn't know at the last conference I saw you? Or what are you doing now that you weren't doing at the last conference I saw you? And it's, uh, I've been thinking a lot about that. And if I had to say, um, the biggest evolution at Village Capital in the last year or so and how we support entrepreneurs has been the topic on this panel. I am by no means an expert on, the, on this topic. I'm mainly here because I'm curious about what our panelists have to say and I want to learn. But I will say for, um, for, m for most of our early life, we were intensely focused at Village Capital about the impact our companies are having on the world, on low-income people, on the, inner, on the environment, um, whatever the companies are doing. And uh, we didn't, to be totally honest, for a very long time, acknowledge the fact that if you're a company, you are probably having a much bigger impact on your coworkers, where you are, the people who work with you, the, the people whose lives you're going to affect the most are the people within your company. And um, we have been very, very lucky to have some great partners who have been 
d thinking and promoting best practices for a very long time. And um, I will talk more about some of these partners in the introductions, but I just want to say that this is, uh, I'm very excited about this session because we, uh, making progress on this issue, I would say, is, is our biggest achievement of the last year in Village Capital. And I think it is uh, really, really critical that all of us who want to support impact enterprises make being a great uh, impact employer part of that part of that uh, part of that objective so that is why I am here and I am excited to hear why everyone else is here so I'm uh, first of all uh, I would love to and each panelist will introduce themselves and their answer to the question but Renata Ron Gomez of the Hitachi Foundation um, we partner with the Hitachi Foundation at Village Capital on a nationwide uh, initiative that we call source where we support, recruit, train, help entrepreneurs find investment. Um, and that is entrepreneurship at work. Is that what it's? Entrepreneurship at work is half of what the Hitachi Foundation does and our partnership is part of that. But the other half of what the Hitachi Foundation does that has really influenced how we can support our companies is good companies at work, which is uh, developing, identifying, highlighting, workforce practices in great companies across the country. So when we talk to our startup entrepreneurs about workforce practices, and this is your question, Renata, um, they say, you know, work, great workforce practices are for bigger, better funded companies that have the cash to help people. Um, we are young, we don't have that much money, we are resource constrained, and I would say, most people at SoCap are resource constrained. So I see a lot of nods here. Like, what can we possibly do as a cash poor startup uh, to be an impact employer? So what are um, some of the lessons you've learned that are applicable to companies everywhere? Thanks, Ross. Um, thanks for that great introduction, and it's an honor to be with you today to talk a little bit about the work at the Hitachi Foundation. And I will get to the question directly, but just to give everybody a little bit of context about the foundation. We were founded in 1985. Um, we are corporate endowed by Hitachi, the large multinational company you may all be familiar with, based in Japan. Um, but we are privately managed, so our board of directors are not affiliated with the company. Um, we have one um, company employee who is kind of an honorary chair, but he does not have a voting role. And so that's allowed us a lot of flexibility as we've developed our strategy. And our strategy over the past almost 30 years has really been refined around the role of business and society, and particularly around the role of um, discovering, disseminating, and really elevating and expanding business practices that both impact the op economic opportunities for low wealth individuals in the United States to have a better, better life, but also at the same time, those practices are really also contributing to the bottom line of the business. And we take that from two different approaches and two different lenses. One of them, as Ross had mentioned, in our entrepreneurship work approach is really working with entrepreneurs and startup companies. And then the second part piece of our work is our Good Companies at Work program, which really focuses on this issue of, work of workforce and employer practices. And throughout the last few years, we've developed um, a series of case studies uh, there's about a hundred of them or so on our website, and there it's called our Pioneer Employers Case Studies, and it talks about different ways that employers, both in healthcare and manufacturing, um, have changed, elevated, advanced workforce practices that have had positive reinforcement and positive opportunities, both for their workers, but also for their customers and for the business around, so all around. So we firmly believe and we have examples um, that demonstrate that by being attentive and being proactive to your inner core and to your employee base, that that also resonates um, with customers and also resonates with the bottom line of the business. So it's a win-win-win for all. So I think going back to your question about what from these pioneer employers, and they're more mature companies, um, have been in business a, a bit longer. Um, I think kind of the three lessons that we can tease out are vision, culture, and sort of timing and strategy. And I'll dive a little bit into each of those. So as you're beginning to launch your business and think about um, 
think about your products, your services, your strategy, we would ask what really is your vision for your company? What as leaders, what kind of culture do you want to create? And this doesn't take money. This doesn't take resources. This just takes the opportunity and the openness and the transparency to ask those difficult questions. And I think we found that, particularly with entrepreneurs, you are so micro-focused on what you need to get done and trying to cram 36 hours into 24 hours um, that those bigger picture questions and those, pictures, those questions around kind of culture and who you want to be as an employer get lost and put aside. Um, and in our experience, those should be kind of sort of your formative and critical questions and should, just take, should take just as much precedence um, as, those, as what widget you are going to be creating and sort of what your, you know, your sales strategy is. So kind of defining those core values and really aligning those to your business and making sure that they reinforce one another, um, I think is one kind of critical piece. So it's not, in our estimation, just about having a social mission and a social impact, but the, the pioneer employer examples um, really demonstrate that if you want to create impact around your, through employment practices, they should be developed from the start. Um, a great example of that is New Belgium Brewery. For those that are familiar with them, based in Fort Collins, Colorado, really well known for fat tire beer and all sorts of really fun practices as well. Um, a great, great pioneer employer from our standpoint and also a supporter of Ross's work and our, our work in source. But they very quickly um, had discussions around what kind of employer they want to be and what kind of culture they wanted to create. And they have 10 core principles. The founder comes from a, a social work background, so she really recognized that the kind of place she wanted to work and the kind of business that she wanted to promote would be better suited and would be more successful if, there, if she had the collective contributions from the employee base. I mean, they have since grown to 500 plus employees, but they continuously go back to the joint core principles that all helped develop and all, all helped contribute to. Um, and those start with being a successful beer company but then there are different strategies and different approaches on what success looks like. And each individual in that company knows what their role is and knows how they contribute to that bottom line and has the, and, and has the support of the leadership to make those decisions. And I think the second, um, second sort of piece of the top three examples would be to, to live an authentic life and sort of respect your employees and just treat them with dignity and empower them and give them the tools and the strategies and the knowledge to make decisions effectively. And recognizing again that those decisions and having that knowledge and those tools and skills will then benefit the bottom line of the business. Um, again, New Belgium Brewery um, were are big fans of uh, an organization called The Great Game of Business. For those that are maybe thinking about this, it's a great resource. Um, and they practice open book management, so it's not just about allowing your employees to look at your finances, but it's, again, giving them the tools to understand what components they're responsible for and how that one piece really impacts and broadens the scope of the full business. Um, there's an organization called Interface, many of you may be familiar with. They're a, a carpet manufacturer, publicly traded company, fairly large. Um, they, know, they are very well known for their environmental sustainability, but they have been working on a, a human capital kind of database uh, to take a look at what, the, what their employee practices, how they contribute to the bottom line. And, um, they have sort of the pluses and minuses, and, and there's a formula that they're working on that I think is really fascinating that really helps to capture that economic impact. Um, again, doesn't, this doesn't require money. Um, it just requires sort of that, that level of dignity that we're all looking for. Um, and then I think the third one is not, as you're launching your business and you're thinking about things, not to get stuck in sort of one approach or saying, oh yeah, open book management is really great and I really want to do that, but um, so I'm going to force everything into that. I think there are multiple approaches 
and multiple strategies that you're probably going to want to test and that you're going to, um, that may change and evolve as your business grows. And I suspect all of you are in some capacity even thinking about exit and recognizing that exit can be really powerful for your employees if it's done correctly and if they're engaged in that process. Um, so I, I, again, it's just, from our standpoint, a lot of it is human dignity, human nature, and kind of common sense. And when those are quantified, um, all really benefit from that process. Thank you so much. Um, our next panelist, uh, Frida Kapoor Klein, uh, and is a co-founder of many things that she can describe. Um, but uh, Frida and her husband, Mitch, co-founded Kapoor Capital and have um, backed and seeded many companies that you may have used today. Has anyone taken Uber today? They were, they were there first. Um, so, I mean, they have uh, really, I mean, they're, they're uh, Frida and Mitch are among the most respected investors in the world, and they uh, have an incredible amount of credibility, and they've been using that credibility to really push the technology community to be more inclusive and to be better employers. So for, it's just one example. Um, we at Village Capital are one of these cash-strapped organizations. You can look up our IRS Form 990 and see exactly how much cash we don't have. Um, but we really want uh, we really want the best people to work with us, and we um, there's an ethos out there saying you know risk everything, go make nothing, it'll all work out in the end, and that is great if, for example, you're in a position where you don't have debt from undergraduate or graduate school. So this idea of bootstrap, bootstrap, bootstrap is uh, wonderful, except for it excludes a lot of people who are not in a personal financial position to do that. Um, we, we're working with Frida uh, to try and figure out ways that we could structure employee benefits uh, as a company at Village Capital, and we came up with um, student loan assistance as an employee benefit, and when we went out and recruited people for roles, all of a sudden, it was a completely different and we thought much stronger candidate pool who were interested in that, even though, again, we don't have a lot of money to pay people. We're meeting people where they're at. So um, that, was, uh, you know, that was one idea that we came up with together that we're, you know, we hope that there are lots of little things like that that cash-strapped startups, nonprofits, et cetera, can do to be more inclusive. So Frida, similar to the question to Renata, um, what are the key take this how you will, do's and don'ts or key lessons if you want to be an inclusive employer um, that you've learned from, from your work. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I wear a few hats. Ross mentioned k Capital, and we co-invest with New Schools Venture Fund. We have a lot of ed tech companies in our overlapping uh, portfolios. We're an investor in New Resource Bank. Um, so I have conflicts with just about everybody on the panel. Um, <laughs> So in addition to that, I started something called the Level Playing Field Institute, which is a nonprofit uh, that runs a summer math and science program for low-income, underrepresented students of color. We've been doing this for 11 summers. Uh, it's a residential program. Um, and it was done for many reasons. It was done to help diversify the tech ecosystem, but it was also done as a specific example for everyone who says, oh, it's a pipeline problem, it's not my problem. It is, we say, okay, we're going to build a pipeline, but we're also going to demonstrate that there is plenty of talent out there that most people would choose to ignore, overlook, and throw away. So I'll, I'll give you an example, and it, um, we're not doing slides, so I can't show you, but uh, a couple weeks ago, I got an email with uh, two photos, and this is from a young African-American woman who went through our SMASH program, and came from a high school with somewhere around a 50% dropout rate. So first of all, she didn't drop out. She finished high school and then went three summers at SMASH and then uh, got into MIT. And so she sent me, and she's one of probably a dozen of our kids that are at MIT, but the two photos she sent me, one is her walking across the stage graduating, and the second is a photo of her diploma which is a double major in physics and nuclear engineering, right? And I think to myself, 
how many tens of thousands of African American girls just like her are we letting drop out of high school, um, let alone or sending to these failure factories? And that's a collective problem, especially for anybody who wants to think about impact. So when we invest in a tech startup with social impact, so our stance, we have a couple of stances. One is we believe that every business has a social impact. Some happen to be positive, many happen to be neutral, and many happen to be negative. And so that framing is really important to say you have an impact, now let's look at what it is. Similarly, as an employer, you're negative, neutral, or positive, and maybe some of all of those things across different dimensions. It's not that it's just for big companies. If you're an employer, you're having an impact on your employees. You're taking a position on how to treat employees. Whatever, if you decide that you can't pay enough or you can't help them with student loans or you can't help with childcare, you're making a choice about where resources go and where resources don't go. And so one of the things that we ask our entrepreneurs to do is a social impact plan for their business. We also ask them specifically for a diversity plan for their business. Um, and how, and especially since most companies that define as impact focus on low income communities of color. And we believe that if your employees don't look like the people you're serving, you are missing out on being as effective and profitable a company as you can be. It's just straightforward business issue to us. When we look at an ed tech company, for instance, and none of the founding team ever went to a public school, and yet the entire purpose of their ed tech company is to help public schools, we say, hmm, how's this going to work out? Um, and how can you possibly know how to do that? One example that we like to give, and you may have seen they were on the front page of the USA Today business section a couple weeks ago, is Frederick Hudson from Pigeonly. Um, which is a company that is radically changing uh, the cost of phone calls to and from prisons. That was a three to four billion dollar a year industry. Um, people were completely exploiting uh, prisoners and their families still in this day and age to charge four dollars a minute for a phone call. And the example, and Frederick himself is formerly incarcerated, and the example I give is you could put Bill Gurley from Benchmark and John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins and name any other Sand Hill Road VC, you could put them in a room for a year and they would never come up with this business. So think about who's at the table. Who's at the founding table? Who's at the funding table? Who's, who are your employees? Because that's where your ideas, your innovation, and the future um, of your business are, are going to come from. Thank you so much, Frida. Um, up next is Chantel Poulsen, uh, who is with New Schools Venture Fund, which is uh, probably the best education technology investor in the world. Um, and they are um, really well regarded. I mean, if you want to get corporate speak about it, you can call it HR, but it's really more the kind, I mean, when you're a startup, HR is really no more complicated than the kind of employer you're going to be. And they have a, a really great reputation for how they work with their companies and how they build their teams. So um, Frida works at the ecosystem level um, and at the company level, but just spoke about more ecosystem level. Chantal, I'd like to talk to you at the direct company level. What are, um, what are some things that you have seen go well or not go well from portfolio companies as they try and, and be good employers? Is this working? Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Um, so again, Chantel, New Schools Venture Fund. We've been around for about 15 years and we're a nonprofit venture philanthropy. Uh, we invest across education. We actually started out mainly investing in charter schools and we're, we're the early um, kind of movers in that space. And we also do some teacher development work. And then the piece of the work that I do is early stage investing in education technology companies. And so we, from a nonprofit standpoint, our mission is to improve the educational opportunities for low-income students and students from underserved backgrounds. And so with that lens, 
lens, that is also how we are looking at our companies and our investing. So a lot of kind of can mimic what um, Frida has said in terms of what we look for when we're working with um, entrepreneurs. So I think the first step is really do, through the diligence process. And um, so we're learning also from Frida about you know, having entrepreneurs really focus on that social impact and diversity, but also understanding what the motivations are of the team. And I think, Renata, you touched on this. And is it a priority of that entrepreneur, of that CEO, to build team and culture? And so where I've seen this go well is when an entrepreneur is already talking about that at the very, very early stages and talking about how they want to do team formation, how they want to build a culture that really reflects their values. Um, so one of the companies that I can give an example is a company called Schoolzilla, um, who's also a co-investor um, uh, with us with Cape Boar. And um, the entrepreneur from, from day one has talked about her vision for building a team that really reflects the students that she's serving. So she is, um, they're actually a B Corp, and they're really focused on, again, low-income, underserved students, often students of color. And she's really thought about, how do I go about building a team that will reflect that community? And so you know, part of it, like I said, is, is thinking about that for, as a priority from, from day one, but also um, kind of putting in practices into place. And one of the things that she mentioned to me, as I think you also echoed, Renata, is starting early. Um, so part of the part of the thing, if, if your founding team um, is all homogenous, it's very difficult th to then think about diversity or bringing on um, people of different backgrounds too late. Because part of the issue is being able to track people um, that may look, look like them um, kind of early on. So she thought about bringing in people who can then tap their networks um, to bring similar voices Voices. Um, the other thing she's really big about is just group think. And so part of her, her um, understanding is that you know, having a homogenous um, employment base uh, really leads to group think. And so that's why she's really thinking about different perspectives. Another nugget that she had just told me is in her kind of recruiting practices, just really being um, thoughtful about messaging. And really, so they're going over their messaging, making sure there's no hidden biases in their messaging, making sure that, um, for example, on their website, I think you kind of touched on this too, who are you deciding to um, show on your website? So for example, they're not showing all of their employees. So they're, they're handpicking who, what employees that they're showing to kind of show a diverse um, set of people. And again, just around the wording, what word you use in, in your job descriptions, just that level of attention and detail um, really goes a long way. And again, this just showing that it's a top priority for the CEO to kind of be that vested this early on when as a, as a startup, there's a million other things that you can be thinking about. Um, another great example in our portfolio, um, what I, I would say would be um, something called Locomotive Labs, and they are creating um, apps for kids with special needs. And actually the founder um, started this out of her own passion because her her son uh, is a special needs student and, and didn't have um, great technology tools um, for education. And so actually what she's really thinking about is having an inclusive work environment as a mother of a student with a special needs. And so what she does is she's actually creating a flexible environment for, for mothers who maybe um, are taking some time off of work because to work with their students or to work with their kids at home um, and giving them work that they can do um, with the company on a flexible arrangement. And so what that means is maybe flexible hours, what that means is um, sometimes uh, the, the mothers can bring their students or they bring their kids to work with them and again, just thinking about what are ways to um, have a work environment that's really inclusive um, for even you know, mothers or people who are really close to that product. So again, thinking really early on. Um, in terms of things that I have not gone seen go well is kind of being disconnected, right? So a like, great example is you know, you're wanting to do maybe public schools and you're kind of just kind of disconnected from your user base and aren't doing anything um, to get close to that user base. And so we like to use the term kind of proximity. And so if, if you're not from that user base, if you don't kind of understand the needs, um, it's really hard to kind of be on the other side. And so and it doesn't have to necessarily always be you have someone on your team that had that experience. That is great great. Um, but another thing that we've seen is people spending time in those communities, um, spending time with those populations that they're really trying to serve. Um, and again, this goes back to messaging. And so, you know, sometimes I've seen what goes wrong is if you have a message saying you're trying to reach a certain population, but then your, um, uh, I guess your ads or your um, 
you know, copy doesn't really reflect that population, that can also be um, kind of a signal or, you know, it just kind of does, contradicts itself. So I think that's the other kind of watch out is that, you know, making sure that your messaging um, and whatever pictures you're using really reflects that kind of user base. Thank you so much. Um, last but not least uh, is the employer, the, the entrepreneur. Um, Vince Siciliano, CEO of New Resource Bank, um, which has a great reputation in our world for workforce practices. And um, Vince, I know it's not easy, but um, speaking, and you can tell us about more about New Resource Bank in this answer, but um, tell us about uh, what you have learned about building a great place to work. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I guess everything I've learned is not to do it the way I used to do it a few years ago. Uh, and uh, pulling this together for talking today was a great opportunity for me to, to re-figure all that out. New Resource Bank is eight years old, and we believe that community resources can be used to achieve well-being for the community and the planet. So if you think about that, community resources, that means we don't have to go far afield into the securities market. Uh, we have local resources that can be used to achieve well-being. What is well-being? We could all spend some time defining that word, and you, you would have ideas immediately what that looks like for people, for the community, and the planet. So I didn't use the word banking at all in that whole thing, but that gets into the how we do it and the what we do is, is the banking side. So it's, it's an unusual mission, and, um, in, in, and we've, we've been through a very hard time. We were created in, in 2008, uh, sorry, 2006, and the recession hit in 2008, and we really dove downhill and had a lot of problems with our loan portfolio, a lot of regulatory issues, and uh, we came under a lot of scrutiny. The whole executive team turned over. Uh, I came in in the middle of that, as did uh, one of my colleagues here, I think Bill Peterson, our chief credit officer, and uh, it was a tough time, and so it was real turnaround time. You talk about pressure, and oh, I see Stephanie, also one of our colleagues, a, real, a lot of pressure. Uh, to, to fix things and go forward. And as we, as we succeeded, as the company turned around, uh, we, we started doing, we did our first employee opinion survey. And so actually, let me step back and say, my framework for this is a triple bottom line concept, but a different use of the word triple bottom line. And the, the, the first bottom line is a great place to work. It, you've got to make it a great place to work. If you make it a great place to work, it'll be a great place to bank in our case, or a great place to do business. That's the second bottom line. And if it's a great place to work and a great place to do business, then it'll be a great place to invest. That's the third bottom line. So different use of that phrase, triple bottom line. So how do you make it a great place to work? And I always would say that I want this to be a great place to work, but saying doesn't make it happen. And we had our first employee opinion survey, I guess it was 2011, and we were still kind of in the danger zone and the survey came out okay. It certainly wasn't great, it wasn't terrible. And then in 2012, now we graduate from all our problems and we get out from under the regulators and things are going well and it's like, hooray, hooray, we're going forward and we have our next employee opinion survey and it's pretty bad. And well, how can that be? We've, we've all just, you know, we've just conquered the mountain, we're up here, we're doing so much better and the employees basically say in many ways, life is not so great. And that was a real wake up call uh, for us. And, and it led me to realize that, you know, there's, a, there's an outside in and there's an inside out to making a place a great, a great place to work. So the outside in is what are we doing in the company to make it a great place to work? And what I learned from that was a lot about um, shared leadership and planning. Uh, that it really wasn't good enough for me to get up and talk about mission, vision, values, and strategy and all that, but we really had to figure out a way to get everybody involved in unpacking that at their level, not only for today, but as we grow and go forward. And one of the tools that we have used, which has really been great, has been the business canvas model. I don't know how many of you know that, but it, it's, a, it's a way to really diagram your business, break it down, and it's very clarifying, very engaging, and we've done that with all our employees. And it's really been terrific. And out of that have come a lot of ideas. Uh, and so we've, we've really broken down our planning to a much more horizontal level throughout the company. So this idea of shared leadership and planning and tolerating some level of chaos, um, just allow stuff to happen, allow ideas to happen. Um, so that, that's been sort of the outside in part 
that, we, that I've learned through this process of, you know, we, we can take certain responsibility for creating an environment that, that helps make it a, a better place to work. But the inside out part for me is just as important. And, and you know, we have an expression that uh, you've, you've all heard about, I want to do good and do well. And the idea is still the bottom line is doing well, but I want to do good, but I want to do well. So the bottom line is doing well. And I think there's a problem with that. Uh, and that is that really from an individual's perspective, I believe the perspective, the, the stand should be, uh, I want to be well and do good. And being well is a much different concept. It means that I am not rooting my sense of security and significance in the marketplace and my accomplishments in the marketplace and what you think of me and my title and where I live and what I drive. It's, it's not about my accomplishments and the approval of others because that's the model of competition, not collaboration. That's the model that separates and discriminates and says I'm up and you're down and distorts and, and generally does not build community. And, Whereas when you move into the economy of well-being, now that's a collaborative model. That's a model that says, I embrace community and I have values. Instead of my values being money, sex, and power, you know, their generosity, you know, and service um, um, and, and, and loving relationships, you know, quite different, quite different values. And I could continue describing those two different economies, but the economy of well-being says, I care about who you are as a person, what's your wiring, what's, what are your passions, your value, your potential in life, and how does all that come together? How do you stand in the middle of all that you know, f with, with a position of personal power and then go to work and then try to change the world? Then go to the marketplace and use the marketplace to do good, but don't be used by the marketplace and don't be defined by the marketplace. So this whole idea of it's both outside in and inside out to create a great place to work. So I think that's, that's really what I've learned over the last couple of years. That's great. Thanks so much, Vince. Um, so I'm, we have about 20 minutes for questions, just keeping an eye on time. Um, what I would love to do is uh, hear from as many of you as we have time for. And so I'm going to have one rule for Q&A, and that is um, only one panelist can answer each question. So if you are interested in a specific panelist's perspective on an issue, you are allowed to ask Vince or Frida a direct question, or a whole panel, you can ask them a direct question. Um, but uh, we will try and get um, more perspectives on more questions to keep it moving. So um, you can ask whichever fa panelist jumps in first, or you can direct it at a specific person. Yes. Check. Um, so this is a question that uh, I'd, I'd love to open up to everybody, but especially since Vince was speaking kind of along the, these lines. Um, I, I wanted to ask this the right way. So a lot of times for us, for us working in small teams with entrepreneurs or with really small founder groups, like a personal shock that could happen to your team, um, somebody gets sick, um, something happens, whatever, can lead to a huge shock for the rest of the, your community, for not just for you and your team, but also for your customers, your customers' customers, everybody, all, all your partners, um, things like that. How do you, when you're trying to do as much good as you can, and you yourself are going on all cylinders too, how do you inoculate yourself against some of these shocks? I know that's a broad question, but it's something that's constantly on my mind and on our, our team's mind. You don't. You, is this on? you don't inoculate yourself against shocks. Uh, you have a plan B and a plan C because the shocks are going to happen. And we find that a lot when we bank, we work with younger companies is they have just a plan A and there's no backup, there's no downside scenario. So you, you plan on shocks. So you have to plan on some, whether it's redundancy among the team or backup ways to get something done, but you can count on them happening. So that may not be the answer you're looking for, but I think you have to plan on them. And that you're going to grow from that ultimately, even though it's painful at the time. Great, thanks. Other questions? Yes. Uh, this is a question for Frida. Um, the entire panel so far seems to have really focused on companies that have self-selected good behavior, that have either had founding teams that are diverse or are prioritizing proximity, Chantelle, as you were describing. Um, but as a wielder of a great deal of capital on the market and a great deal of influence, especially in the venture space, I'm curious, do you think about changing behaviors, perhaps like 
you encounter a company, for example, that is not exhibiting behaviors or diversity in a way that you'd like to see, do you think about um, changing the types of companies that you work with? Like I would think about an Uber, for example. I don't think anyone would inherently think of Uber as a particularly diverse company or a company that particularly prioritizes, you know, employees, and not that they don't, but maybe they're sort of more of a neutral. How do you think about engaging with companies that aren't self-selecting positive behavior right off the bat? It, it's a good question, and sort of the, the lens I bring to this is a lens of hidden bias, which is if you think about what we've learned from advances in neuroscience is we're all wired to be biased. And what distinguishes us is those individuals and therefore those companies that choose to systematically investigate and mitigate those kinds of biases. And so whether somebody's interested in that perspective or not. I think many of you may be aware that the big tech companies out here have been releasing their diversity or their lack of diversity data more appropriately or more accurately. Um, and that doesn't happen by accident. Those numbers don't happen by accident and they don't reflect a meritocracy. And so you've got to start having a conversation, as Chantel said, I mean, things that get baked in at the beginning, there is no substitute for that. But then I think there are things that very well-meaning people miss. So for instance, there was a really fascinating study recently where looking at girls who stay in computer science and and don't, and what's the critical mass of girls in the class that makes a difference. So it turns out that even more than critical mass, which is important, is the environment as deduced from walking in the classroom, and a subtle change, or a change as subtle as a classroom with Star Trek posters uh, had more dropouts than a classroom with nature posters. So how many of you have done an audit of your physical environment and what's on the walls? What does the space convey? So I think there are lots of different layers that we can look at as we look at what, what informs people's employees' decisions. But then also, I, th I think it's really, you asked specifically about behaviors, I think it's really important to come up with a code of conduct and not a politically correct, correct bunch of stuff, absolutely nothing that an employment lawyer has ever touched, because that will be the kiss of death. Um, but what do you really want to live by? What kind of workplace do you want to create? And many of the tech conferences have actually come up with codes of conduct about what's okay. Where's that line between appropriate and inappropriate behavior? Because you don't want to kill humor, you don't want to kill morale, but you don't want to inadvertently allow things that systematically exclude people. So I, I don't know if that's an answer or not. Add the data point about the dog-friendly workplace. <laughs> so we are a dog-friendly, kid-friendly workplace, and, and many places aren't. And I think it makes a huge difference. I'd much rather have an employee who isn't worried about his or her kids getting home from school safely or who they're hanging out with after school or are they doing homework. I mean, look, one of the things we do, so we've got Cape War Capital, we've got the Cape War Center, we've got Level Playing Field. We've got like these geniuses that teach in Smash. What better place to do your homework, right? Um, so having kids and dogs running around an office, I think, is fabulous for morale and good morale is fabulous for productivity. All right, thank you. Um, other questions? Yes. Thank you, hello. Um, let's see, my question is based off of time management and capacity. Um, and we are one of those startups that I feel like of hiding this but no one <laughs> one of these startups that are just um, pushed to our max and I'm noticing as one of the only staff that we just don't have time to get to the things that we want to be doing to to create the type of staff that we're, we are supposed to be doing and um, I was just hoping for some advice on how to how to finish the HR process, how to get the 
um, the retreats going, how to be able to make it a priority to afford it as a startup, um, get the attention that we have to start doing these things. And maybe the answer is you just got to make it a priority, just got to do it. But like that's not helping us move forward with those steps. So I was just hoping for some advice on how to, to deal when you're at capacity. So I think it can be overwhelming to think about all the steps that you need to take. So maybe just um, doing it in bite sizes and taking smaller steps. Um, so, and think about ways to do things cheaply or um, just to integrate little pieces of the HR process. So you just like mentioned a retreat and maybe in your head you're thinking we have to go somewhere, I have to rent out space. I, and so all those pieces start to become overwhelming. But a retreat, like for example, um, we actually open up our space. Um, so some of our companies just come to our space, it's a new space, we open up our conference room and they'll have a retreat in our conference room and so it's somewhere it's off, you know, it's off their campus but it's not far. Um, they can come and, you know, get away from the office and then have some just kind of free time to kind of brainstorm. So it's still a retreat, it's the step in the right direction in terms of creating kind of that, that team building, um, those team building activities and it's not like we have to find the funding to rent a van to go somewhere. So I think just taking kind of some of those baby steps um, will help with the process, that's just one example. I would say, is this on? Um, I would not say that you want, are trying to develop an HR process because I think just framing it that way is going to never get done because who wants to develop an HR process? Um, it's like the kiss of death, um, as many have said. So, and I can't echo enough what Chantel was saying, just take it into bite-sized nuggets and just you know, keep asking the question, what kind of an employer do I want to be? Where do, how do I want to come to work and what kind of values do I want to have? And I think it's sort of just framing it from a, a different entry point will um, release some of your stress potentially around that. And I also think just very briefly, investing a little bit of time and energy into it up front is gonna save you oodles in the long run. I was going to say, yeah, two, the seal is, we're all, the we're seal is broken, the, but this is an important question. So two things I think that are, are great. One is sort of, I think you're getting at the same point, spend a lot of time hiring the right people. So that's something you're going to engage in anyway. So how do you do that? How do you, I mean, are you in a hurry? Uh, is it just competency? You know, what about character? What about chemistry? What about commitment to what you stand for? So there's three other C's there other than just competency. and. I have learned, I mean, we're in a mission-oriented business and we really had a tough time finding bankers who had values that aligned with ours. So find lots of people with values, lots of bankers, but we couldn't find bankers with values. And so, you know, we had a period of compromising. You know, we just had to hire bankers. And then later we realized, oh, we sort of tipped too far that way. We also tipped too far the other way. So we just take a lot of time up front on the hiring. So that's one thing. The second thing would be, the values. I mean, everybody should have values, and values can either be something that's on the wall that are stale and a kiss of death, or you can really, by choosing just two or three values, and really making it clear that these values are here because we, we know we live by these values when we do the following. And here are six examples of what it means to live by the value of transparency, and you, you enumerate them, and everybody gets really clear, and then everybody has the, the authority and the power internally to say, wow, does that fit our values? Those are two things for me that are pretty easy to do uh, up front without creating a process. I was just going to say really quickly, I don't know how many employees do you have? So as soon as you think you can do it in some way that's safe, and it might be an anonymous you know, kind of survey or, or something set up, but I think you want to ask people for, tell me your best day at work here, what happened, and tell me the day you thought about quitting, what happened. And you can do that with six employees, you can do that with 6,000 employees. And that's what's going to give you, and that's much better than an HR process, right? And that's going to give you, that's, a, that's the perfect nugget that Chantel was talking about, that'll tell you what to do. The absolute worst thing you can have is a company where people feel like they have to check themselves at the door. But we don't know what that is for each of our employees. And so guess what? We ask them and then we don't have to guess. 
since we are all breaking the rules on this, I have a quick answer to that, too. <laughs> You've really just beaten the game. Um, very, very tactical. Uh, probably the best time management advice I've ever received. And there's a difference between urgent and important. Um, and you're always doing the urgent things, and then you can never get around to the important things, right? And uh, best advice I ever got was, and I still do this, is every night put three important things on a post-it note, and if it's any bigger than a post-it note, you, it turns into a to-do list and nothing gets done, and do those three things the next day no matter what. And I've, I've been doing that for probably a year and a half, and I, it, it has gone a long way to uh, this helping solve this problem. Yes, I have, Microphone yeah. Microphone friend and then blue sweatshirt friend. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Very enlightening. Um, we're a little bit of a different company, um, early stage. Um, we're B certified corp. Um, we have supply chains across the globe. Um, and so we work with virtual teams and many of them don't know each other or they've not physically been present here in California. Um, do you have any advice as to, as an early stage company, how virtual teams can actually benefit um, from interaction, not only just the leader, but amongst the, um, the other partners in the company itself? Um, maybe some do's and don'ts. It's one of the hardest things to actually get a grip on even though they do know that uh, one of our values, core values, is to honor all the people along the way and behind the scenes. So love to hear um, any of your um, responses. Thank you. So it's a great question. It's a difficult question. And I'm a big fan of Patrick Lencioni's book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And uh, and at the, the, the bottom dysfunction of the team, i.e., if you lack trust, you can't become a high-performing team. You can't go through all the other high-functioning parts of the team if you lack trust. So when you're in different locations, it seems to me that the biggest challenge you have is how do you build trust among people who don't see each other and don't know each other? And, and, and that takes some creative thinking. I mean, I had an experience this past week where I was leading a, a, a planning seminar in a company that had uh, offices in six cities, and so half the people were on, on Skype uh, and on the, on, on the phone. And, and that was a challenge for me, and I realized we had to spend a lot of time up front. How do we build trust among this group, even though they kind of slightly know each other? And we did some storytelling. We did a variety of different exercises, which were real eye-openers to everybody in the room and on the phone, because they didn't know anything about each other. So, you know, this is cross-cultural as well. You're, you're, I don't have the exact answer how to build trust, but figure out trusting exercises that you can do through media to help people uh, get more comfortable, because you want the output that they are going to assume positive intent about everybody else on the team. If they can assume positive intent when they go to a situation, instead of when something happens that they disagree with, instead of thinking, you idiot, you know, they're going to say, well, that's a good person. I'm sure she had something in mind. I just don't understand it. Great, thanks. So the question I have is um, both in the hiring process and kind of retaining values over time. So, you know, at startups don't ha have constraints like um, monetary constraints in hiring people. And even if the founders have strong values and want to impart or find those values in other people, the combination of diversity, of finding people that, with diversity that have strong values and at the right price can be extremely challenging. Um, so, it I mean, it sounds great. And, and um, as a founder, you know, I believe in those things. And, you know, we've predicated our company in those. And by the way, um, we, we intend to have a, a, a treehouse as an office in, in, in reference to your nature versus uh, Star Trek comment. But um, the question is, how do you uh, balance all of those constraints when, when hiring? And do you provide, as thought partners, as investors, do you provide ideation and resources in thinking those things through? 
Yeah, I think that's an important point in terms of really leaning on your investors because like you said, you can't necessarily prioritize those things. I think what an investor brings to the table is maybe a new network. And so as you as you are kind of trying to um, think about all those different constraints, uh, the wider the pool, the easier it is to basically address a lot of those constraints. So I think um, as an investor, yes, we can open up pools. Um, we can think about different pipelines or think about different um, uh, you know, programs that you can go to that may already kind of be filtered and screened um, for those values that you're looking for. And I think, yeah, I think just really having a direct conversation with um, your investors. So I know I talk to my companies all the time and I really know, okay, you're looking for this person, this type of, um, these types of values, this type of diversity profile. Um, and so I'm always kind of searching for that people. So it's not just you searching, but like put everybody else to work um, that's kind of in your ecosystem. We are also, at, at Cape Or Capital, we are hiring a portfolio services diversity person because we recognize that it's hard and it takes longer and it's so important to us that we're doing that. But I want to raise one question in, in consistent with what Ross and I have done on the loan, student loan pool. You don't have to change your comp structure to do things like to decide to create a level playing field by just having a student loan pool available for those who need it. You don't have to, because you're helping one or two or three employees with student loans, doesn't mean that all of a sudden everybody gets an equivalent raise. We are not all, we don't show up at the door of our employer all with the same background and all with the same circumstances. And I think sometimes we confuse um, treating people the same versus treating people fairly. Um, and treating people fairly means taking into account their different circumstances. Um, and some of us show up at the door with student loans and responsibilities to help support extended family members, and some of us show up with trust funds. Um, and that's a, that's a real difference, and you want to be sure that your hiring practices and your comp structure don't inadvertently screen out one group or, or the other. These are decisions that CEOs can make about how, to, how much money they're raising and how they're distributing it. I think there are many things inherent in startup culture that are inherently biased and exclusionary, including very low salaries that for the upside, and as Ross said, it assumes that people have a safety net and can take care of emergencies now. It assumes that people are young and healthy and single, which is a huge set of diversity issues right there. We had one entrepreneur who, you'll understand why we didn't fund him, who said, well, to save money and to keep our burn rate down, we live and work together, and it just is a hassle to have girls around. Um, so we thought it was a hassle to fund him. Um, so, <laughs> but you know, just if you think about these things, I, I said it with a certain affect, but you can imagine somebody actually making a case that this is an incredibly efficient use of capital. So I think you just really want to want to think about um, all those assumptions. Yeah, and I, I mean, if you do things like that, if you meet people where they are, it's really motivating to the team. So there are members of our team who haven't been to graduate school or who don't have debt. And before we set up the pool, I talked to my current coworker saying, this is a benefit I want to offer. And these are people who would not participate in the benefit. And the response was incredible. People were like, that is great. I am so excited to be working for a company that does stuff like this. So um, it's, it's really motivating to employees to do, to do things that are good for employees. That sounds like a stupid comment. So let's go to a couple more questions, yeah. I work with a lot of startup companies, and I'm especially in the tech industry. I've heard similar things to the thing that you just mentioned. Um, what are your thoughts for companies or founders that have started wrong or tried to do their best, but somehow completely missed, missed it entirely? Um, and just kind of what your thoughts are on how do they course correct, or more importantly, how do they regain the trust of their team and their team members? Well. As I think everybody up here has said, it's much easier if you bake it in from the beginning. And that's why those of us who are investors um, can, can really lead you down or encourage you that that's a, a good use of money. But 
certainly as Vince's experience speaks to, you can mid-course correct at any point. Um, I think it's best done and easiest to do when you understand it as a senior person or a founder and you explain it as inherently linked to the success of the business. Uh, that is a much easier thing, a much easier conversation to have than we have this abstract principle um, that, we would, that we would like to do. All right, we are, we are fast running out of time. Sorry for the questions we didn't get to. Um, I would like to close and have, uh, to go back to the, the phrase at the beginning, if we are at SOCAP 2015, um, each of you can say one sentence, what is something that would happen between now and SOCAP 2015 that would get you very, very excited about the way companies make an impact as employers? Um, I SOCAP 2015 would have a full thread of these conversations, um, and I think they're starting to get there, and I think that we're starting to recognize it as a field, um, but I would like it to be um, the norm and not the exception. I, have two. <laughs> uh, I think I would like to see um, that the very definition of a successful company is one that treats employees well and that you, you simply can't succeed, you don't get funding, you don't get escape philosophy, velocity unless you treat employees well. So I would love to see um, the, de the demographics of this audience change even more to start reflecting kind of what we're talking about and the people that are in this room having these conversations are the ones that traditionally maybe one of thought of um, kind of the social sector as um, a place of employment for them. So. And I will just say, by the way, in response to this question, that when that terrible employee opinion survey came out, I was target number one. And so uh, that was a real learning experience for me, coaching, all kinds of things to figure out, wow, you know, what had I done? And uh, as well-intentioned as it might have been, it didn't really matter. And so really changing a lot of things, starting with me, and that was the whole process. So it can be done. Um, I'm great now. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. Um, what would I like to see the next conference? I would like to see this idea of pushing this to, the, to a personal level in people's lives, i.e. that we want people to be well, to go out into the marketplace. And so what does being well look like uh, from a personal perspective, all the dimensions you can think of? I, I would like to see that as, as a focus of this, as a panel somewhere next, next year. Great, well thank you audience. Big round of applause to the panel. Thank I think this is an important conversation. I look forward to continuing in many iterations with all of you. Thanks a lot. Real quick, if you want to ask questions to our panelists as they are on the way out, SOCAP has asked that that happen at the back of the room and not on the stage so that the next panel can get geared up. So I don't know if you guys are around for a couple follow-up questions, but it's great if that happens over there. <laughs>